the Sharangama Sutra, also known as Sutra on the Sharangama Mantra that is spoken from above the crown of the great Buddha's head and on the hidden basis of the thus come one's myriad bodhisattva practices that lead to their verifications of ultimate truth. Fascicle 1 of 10 Translated into Chinese in the Tong Dynasty on 23 May 705 A.D. at Chu Chu Monastery in Guangzhou by Shramana Paramiti from Central India. Reviewed by Shramana Megashika from Udiana. Verified by Shramana Huai Di from Nanlo Monastery on Mount Lu Fo of Shunzhou. Edited by attending minister, court regulator, and former state censor Fang Grong from Qing He, a disciple of the Buddha and follower of the Bodhisattva precepts. Translated from Chinese into English by Charles Luck. The unsurpassed, profound, and wonderful Dharma is difficult to encounter in hundreds of millions of eons. I now see and hear it, receive and uphold it, and I vow to fathom the Tathagata's true meaning. Chapter 1 The Numenon in the Tathagata Store Thus have I heard, once the Buddha stayed in the Jetavana Vihara near Shravasti with 1,250 bhikshus, most of whom were great arhats who had crossed the stream of transmigration. They held up his teaching firmly, could leap over all realms of existence, and had achieved the respect-inspiring deportment which was held in great esteem throughout the country. They followed the Buddha to turn the wheel of the law, and were qualified to hand down his dharma. Being self-disciplined, they set a good example in the three worlds in which they appeared in countless transformation bodies to deliver beings and to save future generations from defilement. They were led by Sariputra the Wise, Maha Maudgalyayana, Maha Kaustila, Purna Maitra Yani Putra, Subhuti, and Upanisad. There were also countless Pratyeka Buddhas who, since they had conquered their old habits, had nothing more to learn, yet came to the Buddha's Vihara determined to seek ultimate truth. Now the summer retreat had just finished when the bhikshus took stock of their errors and mistakes and when the bodhisattvas from the ten directions determined to wipe out their remaining doubts and suspicions reverently awaited the teaching in their search for its esoteric meaning. And so the Tathagata arranged his seat and sat with crossed legs to proclaim the profound doctrine. Such a dharma feast to purify the assembly had never taken place before, and his melodious voice was heard in the ten quarters. Led by Manjushri, a number of bodhisattvas, as countless as sand grains in the Ganges, had come to the holy place. Meanwhile, King Prasenajit, who was keeping the anniversary of his father's death by offering vegetarian food to him, came personally to invite the Tathagata to the inner palace for a royal feast of best and rarest delicacies, to which he also invited the great bodhisattvas in the assembly. In the city, the elders and devotees also offered food to members of the order and reverently waited for the Buddha's arrival. Ananda's Weakness, the reason for this sermon. Commanded by the Buddha, Manjushri took the bodhisattvas and arhats to the royal feast. Ananda, however, had not come back from a distant engagement, and so was not among the invited. He was returning to the Vihara alone, without his superior or teacher, and bowl in hand went begging from door to door in a nearby town. He intended to call first on a donor who had not given food to the monks that day, regardless of whether or not he was virtuous, a noble, or an outcast. In his practice of universal compassion, he did not especially choose a poor man as his patron. He wanted to help all living beings earn countless merits, for he had seen the Buddha scold Subhuti and Mahakashyapa, who, though being arhats, could not realize universal mind when begging for food. 
He very much admired his teaching, which had eliminated all his doubts and suspicions in this respect. So when he reached the town's gate, he walked slowly, adjusting his being to the rules of discipline. As he went begging for food, he came to a house of prostitution, where Matanji, a low-caste woman, succeeded by means of Kapila magic in drawing him close to her sensual body on the mat so that he was on the point of breaking the rules of pure living. But the Buddha was aware of all this, and after the royal feast, he returned to the Vihara with the king, princes, and elders who wished to hear about the essentials of the Dharma. He then sent out from the top of his head a bright and triumphant multicolored light, within which appeared a transformation Buddha seated with crossed legs on a thousand-petaled lotus. The Buddha then repeated the transcendental mantra and ordered Manjushri to use it to overcome the magic and to bring Ananda with Matanji to the Vihara. Meditative study of all as void, or Samatha. When Ananda saw the Buddha, he prostrated himself at his feet, weeping bitterly and saying that, since the time without beginning, though he had heard much about the Dharma, he still could not acquire the transcendental power of the Tao. Earnestly, he asked the Buddha to teach the preliminary expedients in the practice of Samatha, Samapati, and Dhyana, which led to the enlightenment of all Buddhas in the Ten Directions. There was also present a great number of bodhisattvas, as countless as grains of sand in the Ganges, and great arhats and pratyeka buddhas who had come wishing to hear about the Dharma. They all waited silently and reverently for the holy teaching. Wiping out the five aggregates and eight consciousnesses to expose the unreality of ego probing into the false mind to wipe out the first two aggregates and first five consciousnesses. The Buddha said to Ananda, You and I are close relatives. Tell me what you saw in the assembly when you made up your mind to give up all worldly feelings of affection and love to follow me. Ananda replied, I saw the thirty-two excellent characteristics and the shining crystal-like form of the Buddha's body. I thought that all this could not be the result of desire and love, for desire creates the foul and fetid impurities like pus and blood which mingle and cannot produce the wondrous brightness of his golden-hued body, in admiration of which I shaved my head to follow him. The Buddha said, Ananda and all of you should know that living beings, since the time without beginning, have been subject continuously to birth and death, because they do not know the permanent true mind, whose substance is, by nature, pure and bright. They have relied on false thinking, which is not reality, so that the wheel of samsara turns. Now, if you wish to study the unsurpassed Supreme Bodhi to realize this bright nature, you should answer my questions straightforwardly. All Buddhas in the Ten Directions trod the same path to escape from birth and death because of their straightforward minds, with the same straightforwardness of mind and speech from start to finish without a trace of crookedness. Ananda, when you develop that mind because of the Buddha's 32 excellent characteristics, tell me what you saw and loved about them. Ananda replied, World Honored One, my love came from the use of my mind, my eyes seeing and my mind admiring them, so that it was set on relinquishing birth and death. The Buddha continued, As you just said, your love was caused by your mind and eyes. But if you do not know where your mind and eyes really are, you will never be able to destroy delusion. For instance, when the country is invaded by bandits, the king, before sending his soldiers to destroy them, should first know where they are. That which causes you to transmigrate without interruption comes from defects in your mind and eyes. Now tell me where your mind and eyes are. Ananda replied, World Honored One, all living beings born in the world through the ten types of birth hold 
that this knowing mind is in the body. As I look at the lotus blue eyes of the Buddha, I see that they are on his face. Hence my understanding that my eyes are on my face, whereas my knowing mind is in my body. The Buddha asked, Now, as you sit in this hall, where do you see Jetavana Park? Ananda replied, World Honored One, this great hall is in Jetavana Park, which is therefore outside the hall. The Buddha asked, What do you see first in this hall? Ananda replied, World Honored One, in this hall I see first the Tathagata, then the assembly, and only when looking outside do I see the park. The Buddha asked, When you see the park, what causes you to do so? Ananda replied, It is because the doors and windows are open that I, though sitting in this hall, see the park outside. The Buddha then extended his golden-hued arm and touched Ananda's head with his hand, saying, There is a samadhi called the all-embracing supreme Surangama, a gateway through which all Buddhas in the ten directions attain to the wondrous majestic path. Ananda, listen now attentively. Ananda prostrated himself at the Buddha's feet and knelt to receive the holy instruction. The Buddha said, if you are right that, while sitting in this hall, you see the park outside through the open doors and windows, it would be possible for someone sitting here to see only things outside without seeing the Buddha within. Ananda replied, One cannot see the grove and stream outside without seeing the Buddha here. The Buddha said, Ananda, it is the same with you. If your mind is not deluded, it will be clear about all this. However, if your knowing mind was really in your body, you should first be clear about everything inside it. You should therefore see everything in your body before seeing things outside it. Even if you cannot see your heart, liver, spleen, and stomach, at least you should be clear about your growing nails and hair, about that which moves along your nerves and the pulsing of your veins. Why are you not clear about all this? If you do not see things within, how can you see those outside? Therefore, your contentions that your knowing mind is inside your body is groundless. Ananda bowed and said, After hearing the Buddha's Dharma voice, I now understand that my mind is really outside my body. For instance, a lamp should light up everything in a room before the courtyard outside through the open door. If I do not see what is in my body, but see things outside it, this is like a lamp placed outside a room which cannot light what is in it. This being so clear that there can be no doubt, am I still wrong about what the Buddha means? The Buddha said, All the bhikshus followed me to Shravasti, to beg for food and have now returned to Jetavana Park. I have taken my meal, but as one bhikshu is still eating, is the whole community well fed? Ananda replied, No, world honored one. Though they are our hearts, they have not the same body or lifespan. Then how can one, by eating, cause all the others to satisfy their hunger? The Buddha said, if your knowing mind is outside your body, the two are separate. Thus, when your mind knows something, your body should not feel it, and when your body feels something, your mind should not be aware of it. Now, as I show you my hand, when your eyes see it, does your mind discern it? Ananda replied, Yes, world honored one, my mind discerns it. The Buddha said, If so, how can your mind be outside your body? Therefore, your contention that your knowing and discerning mind is outside your body is groundless. Ananda said, World Honored One, as you have said, if my mind does not see what is in my body, it is not within it. And if my body and mind know each other, they are not separate. And my mind is therefore not outside my body. Now after thinking about this, I know where my mind is. The Buddha asked, Where is it? Ananda replied, 
Since my knowing mind does not see what is in my body, but can see things outside, I think it is hidden in my sense organ. For instance, if one covers one's eyes with a crystal bowl, the latter does not obstruct this sense organ, which simply follows the faculty of seeing to distinguish all things seen. Thus, if my knowing mind does not see what is in my body, it is because it is in the sense organ, and if it sees clearly what is outside without being obstructed, it is because it is hidden in that organ. The Buddha asked, As you just said, the mind is hidden in the same way that the eyes are covered by the crystal bowl. Now, when one so covers them and sees the mountains and river, does one also see the bowl? Ananda replied, Yes, world honored one, one also sees the bowl. The Buddha said, If your mind is like the crystal bowl, when you see the mountain and river, why do you not see your own eyes? If you do, they should be outside and should not follow your faculty of seeing. If they cannot be seen, how can you say that this knowing mind is hidden in the sense organ, like the eyes covered by the crystal bowl? Therefore, your contention that the knowing mind is hidden in the sense organ is groundless. Ananda asked, World Honored One, I now think of the bowels concealed in the body and of the apertures on its surface. Therefore, where there is concealment there is darkness, and where there are openings there is light. As I am now before the Buddha, I open my eyes and see clearly, and this is called outward seeing. And when I close them, I see only darkness, and this is called inward seeing. What does the Buddha think of this? The Buddha said, When you close your eyes and see darkness, is this darkness opposite to your eyes or not? If it is, it is in front of them. Then how can this be inward seeing? Even if there is really such inward seeing, when you sit in a dark room without the light of the sun, moon, or a lamp, this darkness should also be in your bowels. If it is not opposite to your eyes, how can there be any seeing? Now, let us forget your so-called outward seeing and assume that there is inward seeing. Then, when you close your eyes and see only darkness, which you call seeing, what is in your body? Why, when you open them and see clearly, do you not see your face? If you do not, there is no such inward seeing. Now, assuming that you can see your face, your knowing mind and organ of sight should be in the air. And then, how can there be inward seeing? If they were in the air, they should not belong to your body. And the Buddha, who now sees your face, should be your body as well. Thus, when your eyes see something, your body should have no feelings. If you insist that both body and mind have separate feelings, there should be two separate perceptions, and then your body should one day become two Buddhas. Therefore, your contention that to see darkness is inward seeing is groundless. Ananda said, I have always heard the Buddha when teaching monks, nuns, and male and female devotees say, when the mind stirs, all sorts of things are created, and then all kinds of mind appear. I now think that the substance of my thinking is the nature of mind which arises when it unites with externals and which is neither within nor without nor in between. The Buddha said, You have just said that because phenomena are created, all kinds of mind appear when uniting with them. So this mind has no substance and cannot unite with anything. If that which has no substance can unite with externals, this is union of the nineteenth realm of sense and the seventh sense datum. This is sheer nonsense. If the mind has substance, when your hand grasps your body, does your mind feeling this touch come from within or without? If from within, you should see what is in your body, and if from without, you should see your face. Ananda said, It is the eyes that see, and the mind that knows is not the eyes. To say that it sees is wrong. The Buddha said, 
If the eyes can see when you are in a room, do you see the door outside? Those who are dead and still have eyes should see things. If they still see, how can they be dead? Ananda, if your knowing mind has substance, is that substance single or manifold? As it is in your body, does it spread to every part of it or not? If it is one substance, when you grasp a limb, all four should feel that they are grasped. If so, there would be no grasping of any particular limb. If there is, the contention of a single substance does not hold good. If it is a manifold substance, there should be many persons. Then, which substance is yours? If it spreads to every part of your body, this is the same as the previous case of grasping. If it does not spread, then when you touch your head and foot at the same time, while your head feels that it is touched, your foot should not, but this is not so. Therefore, your contention that the mind arises where there is union with externals is groundless. Ananda said, World Honored One, I have heard the Buddha discuss reality with other sons of the King of the Law, that is Bodhisattvas, he also said that the mind is neither within nor without. I now deduce that if the mind is in the body, it does not see anything within, and if it is outside, they both cease to feel each other. To say that it is within is wrong, for it does not know anything in the body. To say that it is without is also faulty, since body and mind can perceive each other. As they do so, and since nothing is seen in the body, the mind should be between the two, that is, the inside and outside. The Buddha said, If your conception of mind in between is correct, it implies a position for it. Now, according to your inference, where is this intermediate position? Do you mean that it is in or on the body? If it is on the surface of the body, it cannot be in its center, and the conception of a mind in the center is no different from that of a mind in the body, which was refuted earlier. Moreover, is its position manifest or not? If it is not, it does not exist. If it is, it is not fixed. Why? For instance, if a stake is driven into the ground to mark a center, when seen from the east, it is in the west, and when seen from the south, it is in the north. As this stake can only lead to confusion, so is your conception of a mind in between completely chaotic. Ananda said, The intermediate position that I mentioned is not these two. As the World Honored One has said, the eyes and form are causes from which sight perception arises. While the eyes can distinguish, form does not follow anything, and perception lies between them. Hence, the mind arises. The Buddha said, If the mind lies between sense organs and sense data, does it include both or not? If it does, its substance and what is outside will be mixed up together. And, since the mind perceives, while its objects do not, two opposites will be set up. Then how can there be an intermediate position? If it is not inclusive, that is, if it is independent of the sense organs and sense data, being neither the knower or subject, nor the known or object, it has no substance. Then, what is this intermediate? Therefore, your contention that it is in between is groundless. Ananda said, World Honored One, Previously, when I saw the Buddha, with his four chief disciples, Maha Maud Galyayana, Subhuti, Purnamatrayani Putra, and Sariputra, turned the wheel of the law, he always said that the nature of the knowing and discriminating mind is neither within nor without, nor between the two, exists nowhere and clings to nothing, and hence is called mind. Is that which does not cling to things called mind? The Buddha replied, 
You just said that the nature of the knowing and discriminating mind exists nowhere. Now in this world, all things in the air, in water, and on the ground, including those that fly and walk, make the existing whole. By that which does not cling to anything, do you mean that it exists or not? If it is not, it is just the hair of a tortoise or the horn of a hare. Then how can there be this extra non-clinging? If it is, it cannot be said not to exist. That which is not is simply non-existent, and that which is should have a position. Then how can there be no clinging? Therefore, your contention that that which does not cling to anything is the knowing mind is groundless. Refuting the false mind to eliminate the third aggregate and expose the unreality of the sixth consciousness. Thereupon, Ananda rose from his seat, uncovered his right shoulder, knelt upon his right knee, reverently joined the palms of his hands, and said to the Buddha, I am the Tathagata's youngest cousin, and because of his great affection, I have been allowed to be his disciple. But I have presumed on his compassion. And so although I have heard much of his preaching, I have failed to avoid the worldly and have been unable to overcome the magic which has turned me around, causing me to visit a house of prostitution. All this is because I failed to reach the region of reality. May the world-honored one be compassionate enough to teach us the path of Samatha for the benefit of those lacking faith and holding perverted views. After saying this, he prostrated himself with knees, elbows, and head on the ground. Then he stood up in reverent silence, with the whole assembly keenly awaiting the teaching. Revealing the Bright Samadhi By the Buddha's transcendental power, all sorts of rays of light, as brilliant as hundreds and thousands of suns, shone from his forehead, illuminating all the Buddha lands which shook with six kinds of quake. Thus a number of worlds, uncountable as the dust, appeared simultaneously, and, by the same power, united into a single world, wherein each of the great bodhisattvas, while staying in his own realm, brought his palms together to listen to the Dharma. Origin of Inversion The Buddha said, Since the time without beginning, all living beings have given rise to all sorts of inversion because of the karmic seed of ignorance, which is like the aksa shrub. This is why seekers of the truth fail to realize supreme enlightenment, but achieve only the states of shravaka, pratyeka buddhas, heretics, divas, and demons solely because they do not know the two basic inversions, thereby practicing wrongly like those who cannot get food by cooking sand, in spite of the passing of eons as countless as the dust. What are these two basic inversions? Ananda, the first is the basic root of birth and death, caused since the time without beginning by the wrong use of a clinging mind, which people mistake for their own nature. And second is their attachment to causal conditions, which screen the basically bright essence of consciousness, which is the fundamentally pure and clean substance of nirvanic enlightenment. Thus, they ignore this basic brightness, and so transmigrate through illusory realms of existence without realizing the futility of their wrong practice. Actual Inversion The Inverted Mind Probe into the False Mind Ananda you have inquired about the Samatha gateway through which to escape from birth and death. I must ask you a question. The Buddha then held up his golden-hued arm and bent his finger, saying, Ananda, do you see this? Ananda replied, Yes. The Buddha asked, What do you see? Ananda replied, I see the Buddha raise his arm and bend his fingers, showing a shining fist that dazzles my mind and eyes. 
the Buddha asked, How do you see it? Ananda replied, I and all those here use the eyes to see it. The Buddha asked, You say that I bend my fingers to show you a shining fist that dazzles your mind and eyes. Now tell me, as you see my fist, what is that mind which perceives its brightness? Ananda replied, As the Tathagata asks about the mind, and since I am using my own to search for it exhaustively, I conclude that that which searches is my mind. Thinking is unreal, the Buddha said. Hey, Ananda, this is not your mind. Ananda stared with astonishment, brought his two palms together, rose from his seat and asked, If this is not my mind, what is it? The Buddha replied, Ananda, this is your false thinking, which arises from external objects, deludes your true nature, and deceives you into mistaking, since the time without beginning, a thief for your own son, thereby losing sight of that which is basically permanent. Hence the round of birth and death. The sixth consciousness is empty. Ananda said, I am the Buddha's beloved youngest cousin, whose mind so admired him that I left home to serve and make offerings to the Tathagata and to all Buddhas and enlightened teachers in lands as countless as sands in the Ganges. If I am determined to do all difficult Dharma duties, it is because I use this mind. And even if I now slander the Dharma, causing my excellent qualities to weaken forever, it is also because of this mind. If it was not mind, I would have no mind and would be like the earth or a log, for nothing exists beyond what I feel and know. Why does the Buddha say that this is not mind? This frightens me and also this assembly, and not one of us here can avoid being doubtful and suspicious about it. Will you be so compassionate as to enlighten us? From his lion's seat, the Buddha, in order to teach Ananda and the assembly, so that they could all achieve the patient endurance of the uncreate, or Anutpatika Dharma Kashanti, held out his hand to touch Ananda's head, saying, The Tathagata has always said that all phenomena are manifestations of mind, and that all causes and effects, including all things from the world, to its dust, take shape solely because of the mind. Ananda, if we look at all the worlds and all existing things, including even grass and leaves, and investigate their roots, they are all made of matter and have qualities. And even the empty void has its name and appearance. Then how can the pure and clean profound bright mind, which is the underlying nature of every discriminating mind, be without its own substance? If you grasp firmly the knowledge which comes from your discriminations between feeling and seeing as your true mind, it should have its own nature, independent of all sense data such as form, smell, taste, and touch. As you now listen to my sermon on the Dharma, you differentiate because you hear my voice. The seventh consciousness is unreal. Even if you succeed in putting an end to all seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing, and so preserve inner quiet, the shadow of your differentiation of things or dharma still remains. I do not want you to hold that this is not mind, but you should examine it carefully and minutely. That which continues to possess discerning nature, even in the absence of sense data, is really your mind. On the other hand, if this discerning nature ceases with sense data, this is merely the shadow of your differentiation of them, for they are not permanent, and when they cease to exist, so does this so-called mind, like the hair of a tortoise and the horns of a hare. If your dharmakaya can so easily cease to be, who will then practice and realize the patient endurance of the uncreate? After hearing this, Ananda and all those present were completely bewildered. Refuting all inversion, the Buddha said, 
practicing students, even after they have realized the nine successive states of dhyana, still cannot step out of the stream of transmigration and so fail to become arhats, because they cling to this samsaric false thinking which they mistake for reality. This is why, though you have heard much of my dharma, you have failed to win the holy fruit. The Inverted Perception After hearing this, Ananda, in bitter tears, prostrated himself with his head, knees, and elbows on the ground, knelt, and brought his two palms together, saying, After I left home to follow the Buddha, I merely relied on his transcendental power and always thought that I could dispense with practice since he would bestow samadhi upon me. I did not know that he could not be my substitute, and so lost sight of my fundamental mind. This is why, though I joined the order, my mind was unable to enter the Tao. I was like a destitute son running away from his father. I only realize now that, in spite of much listening to the Dharma, if I do not practice it, I shall come to nothing as if I had not heard it like a man who cannot satisfy his hunger by merely speaking of food. World Honored One, I am caught by the two hindrances because I do not know the real nature of the still and permanent mind. May the Tathagata be compassionate enough fully to reveal to me that wondrous bright mind and so open my Tao eye. A bright light to reveal the one reality Thereupon, the Tathagata, from the Salvastika on his chest, sent out a radiant multicolored precious light which illuminated the Buddha lands in the ten directions as countless as the dust, and which, after shining on the heads of all Buddhas everywhere, veered to Ananda and the assembly. The Buddha then said to Ananda, I now hoist the banner of great Dharma so that you and all living beings in the ten directions can realize the pure and bright mind of your profound and subtle nature, and so win the eye that is pure and clear. Returning Perception to Mind Ananda, a moment ago you said that you saw my shining fist. Tell me, how did its brightness come about? What caused it to take the form of a fist? And with what did you see it? Ananda replied, The Buddha's golden-hued body is like a precious hill and manifests the state of purity and cleanness, so that the fist shone. It was really my eyes that saw him bend the fingers and form the fist, which was shown to all of us. The Buddha said, In truth, Wise people should be awakened by examples and analogies. Ananda, if I had no hand, I would have no fist, and if you had no eyes, you would have no faculty of seeing. Is there any connection between your organ of sight and my fist? Ananda replied, Yes, World Honored One. If I had no eyes, I would have no faculty of seeing. So there is an analogy between my organ of sight and the Buddha's fist. The Buddha said, Your reasoning is incorrect. For instance, a handless man has no fist, but a man without eyes still has his faculty of seeing. When you meet a blind man and ask him what he sees, he will tell you there is nothing but darkness in front of him. Therefore, though things may be screened from view, the faculty of seeing continues. Ananda said, If a blind man sees nothing but darkness before him, how can this be called seeing? The Buddha asked, Is there any difference between the darkness seen by a blind man in front of him and that seen by a man who is not blind when he is in a dark room? Ananda replied, World Honored One, there is no difference. The Buddha said, Ananda, when a blind man who used to see only darkness suddenly recovers his sight and sees everything clearly. If you say it is in his eyes which see, then when a man who saw darkness in a dark room suddenly lights a lamp which enables him to see what is there, you should say that it is the lamp that sees. 
If a lamp can see things, it should have the faculty of seeing and should not be called a lamp. If it really sees, it has no relation to you. Therefore, you should know that while the lamp can reveal form, seeing comes from the eyes, but not from the lamp. Likewise, while your eyes can reveal form, the nature of seeing comes from the mind, but not from the eyes. Inverted Men Although Ananda and the assembly had heard these words, they remained speechless. As they did not awaken to the teaching, they brought their palms together and waited for the Buddha's further instruction with their minds set on hearing it. The Worldlings Inverted Views The Buddha then held up his shining hand, straightened his fingers to give further instruction to Ananda and the assembly, and asked, After I attained enlightenment, or Bodhi, I went to Mragadava Park, where I told Ajnata, Kaundinya and his group of five bhikshus, as well as you monks, nuns, and devotees, that all living beings failed to realize enlightenment and became erhats, because they were misled by foreign dust which created delusion and distress by entering their minds. What at that time caused you to awaken so that you can now win the holy fruit? Ajnata Kaundinya then rose from his seat and replied to the Buddha, I am now senior in the assembly, in which I am the only one who has acquired the art of interpreting, because I had awakened to the meaning of the expression foreign dust, so that I won the holy fruit. World honored one, foreign dust is like a guest who stops at an inn where he passes the night, or eats something, and then packs and continues his journey because he cannot stay longer. As to the host of the inn, he has nowhere to go. My deduction is that one who does not stay is a guest, and one who stays is a host. Consequently, a thing is foreign when it does not stay. Again, when the sun rises in a clear sky and its light enters the house through an opening, the dust is seen to dance in the ray of light, whereas the empty space does not move. I deduce that that which is still is the void, and that which moves is the dust. Consequently, a thing is dust when it moves. The Buddha said, Correct. The Hinayanists inverted views. The Buddha then bent, straightened, and rebent his fingers and asked Ananda, What did you see? Ananda replied, I saw the Buddha open and close his fist. The Buddha asked, You say that you saw my fist open and close. Was it my fist? or your seeing that opened and closed. Ananda replied, As the Buddha's fist opened and closed, I saw that it, and not the nature of my seeing, did so by itself. The Buddha asked, Which one moved, and which was still? Ananda replied, The Buddha's hand was not still. As to the nature of my seeing, which was already beyond the state of stillness, it could not move. The Buddha said, Correct. Thereupon, the Buddha sent out from his palm a radiant ray of light to Ananda's right, and the disciple turned to look at it. Then he sent out another ray to Ananda's left, and the disciple turned to look at it. The Buddha then asked, Why did your head move? Ananda replied, I saw the Buddha send out radiant rays of light to my right and left. I turned to look at them, and so my head moved. The Buddha said, As you turn to the right and left to see the Buddha light, is it your head or your seeing that moves? Ananda replied, World honored one, it is my head that turns. As to my seeing, which is already beyond the state of stillness, how can it move? The Buddha said, Correct. The Buddha then declared to the assembly, so every worldly man knows that what moves is dust, and that he who does not stay is a guest. You have seen Ananda, whose head moved of itself, whereas his seeing was unmoved. You have also seen my fist, which opened and closed of itself, whereas his seeing neither expanded nor contracted. 
Why do you still regard the moving as your body and surroundings, and so from the beginning to end allow your thoughts to rise and fall without interruption, thereby losing sight of your true nature and indulging in backward actions? By missing the true mind of your nature and by mistaking illusory objects for yourselves, you allow yourselves to be caught in the wheel of samsara, thereby forcing yourselves to pass through transmigrations.